Well, good morning again. Here we are Sunday morning, November 29th, 2020. You and me and <clears throat> whoever else might be out there and maybe some other people along the way. Good morning or if you're watching this later, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, God bless you today. And I hope it is a good day for you. You know, as I was thinking this week about what to talk about on this uh, particular Sunday, the Sunday after Thanksgiving. And I know Thanksgiving has been referenced a lot the last few days, and it should be. It should be referenced every day in our lives. Our day should begin with thanking God uh, for what he's done, for who he is, for all he has done for us, for his great love. But I was uh, reading through things this week and, and looking at things, and I saw an article that genuinely struck me. It moved me uh, very, very deeply. And perhaps it's because I have a passion uh, for uh, this area, or, or, or I, I don't know why. Maybe God just said, you know, this is this is something that needs to be talked about. And I wonder about it a little bit, but uh, we follow God's lead. And uh, it was an article by Ken Ham, who is uh, uh, in uh, the uh, person who runs the uh, and started the uh, organization called Answers in Genesis. They have the Ark there in Kentucky, which you should go see. And uh, he is a great creationist, and so uh, and and teaches biblical creation, and uses uh, true science uh, in every aspect of his books and his work. And he's a great theologian. And uh, he is he was uh, talking about another article that he had read, and um, the article <clears throat> was by a person who was an atheist. And the question was, and I, I thought it was so interesting, so perplexing. And so thought-provoking to those who are atheist, and maybe to those of us who are Christians or call ourselves Christians, but we live like we're an atheist. Yeah, I know. You know, you scratch. I don't know. It's uh, nervous, I guess. But uh, uh, anyway, um, and so and so the question that he made mention of is something that has to be deep <clears throat> inside the heart of everyone, and yet something that uh, should be greatly concerning to those who reject the existence of God <clears throat> or reject Jesus Christ. And it's the question is, who will remember us after we're gone? You know, the, the, the fact of the matter is that we all die. We're all going to die. Unless Jesus Christ comes and takes us Christians out of here uh, through the rapture, Everyone hearing this, everyone alive right now within the next uh, hundred years or maybe some a little more will be dead. Imagine that. Think of all the people that the doctors work to save their lives and they save a life. The paramedics save a life in a car wreck or the doctors save a life of, of a gunshot victim or um, the, the doctors save a life of someone with a dread disease. They save thousands, thousands, thousands of people that get the COVID-19, they save their lives. But what happens to the, all these people later? They all die. You see, a doctor or a nurse or a paramedic, they can't save a life. They can use the great skills and techniques that God's blessings have given us to extend a life. And that's all. Because everyone dies. And so we all have this desire in our heart. We all have it to be remembered. The thing, to have the things we've done remembered, to have the things perhaps that we've written or spoken or created or built remembered. We want to think that somehow we live on in the memory and the hearts and the lives of others. But let me tell you something. I, I ask yourself this question. How many of you know anything about your great, 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 great grandparents? Their names, what they did, what was important to them, the things they created, the important things they said. How many of us even know these and even heard them if we only go back a few generations? And so for those of us who are clinging to memory of our children or grandchildren, and, uh, you know, to, to, to carry on that, that uh, desire to go on, it will be forgotten. Now, I know, I know, hey, we got some movies now. We got videos. We can, we can carry ourselves forward in videos. But let me tell you something. The only movies that move forward and carry forward are movies that are great stories, great content. Those home videos, uh, they're not going to matter down in the future. Certainly down in the far future. But um, 
we have this desire to go on in some way. We do not want our memory of who we were, who what we were, to completely disappear. And yet, in time, it is inevitable. If, and this is a big if, but bear with me a moment. Let me take you to a different worldview. If time were to go on and on and on for millions of years, millions of years, and if the Bible is not true, then the memory of our lives the work we've done, the things we've done that matter to us will all eventually be forgotten and gone. All people for all time, everything that's ever been done or created will eventually be gone if the world goes on in the evolutionist view. Our light, our, our life and our light giving sun will eventually use up its fuel. It will burn out. And our solar system will go dark. It will go dark. And there will be nothing to, to continue life on this planet. And our planet will die in that scenario. And all the buildings that are named for all the people that have done something significant will crumble and fall. The bridges that are named for these what we call great people will fall to the ground, will, will crumble. The, the airports will that are named and the terminals that are named after politicians and others, they'll all just fall apart. Uh, all the collective knowledge gained from the beginning of time will be forever lost. Uh, the great compositions, the music scores, the books, the orations will all be forgotten. The great inventions will be lost in a meaningless void. The great advances in knowledge and technology will all come to naught. The great deeds, the kind and wonderful deeds, the, the even, even the horrible things that man has done to man come be forgotten. Won't matter in a million years or two million years or a hundred million years or a billion years. Uh, the, the great discoveries of science, mathematics, philosophy, the arts, the great engineering feats man has built will not even be a memory stored someplace. Think of that. You store your memory in your hard drive or your USB or your cloud. Cloud's going to be gone. No memory. No memory. Think All the great discoveries, uh, the acts of love and sacrifice, the, the eloquent speeches, the heroic deeds of no eternal consequence. With enough time, it would be as if man never existed, that no man ever existed. In this, the worldview of the atheist, those who reject God, if time were to go on forever, and if the Bible is not true. But folks, the fact is that the same thing in your heart that compels you to want to be remembered also compels you to seek God. It's not a God-shaped vacuum. It's just the fact that God has put in our hearts to seek him. Uh, these two ifs are the philosophy. These two ifs, the if time goes on forever. And uh, <clears throat> and if, if the Bible's not true, or a philosophy of those who reject God Almighty, they reject that God lives. And so I would ask them, if they're out there, if they're listening, and I would ask you to consider why are you living? What is your purpose? You know, even Christians get caught up in this philosophy because we're inundated with it. And it seeks in in little pieces here and there and we start living as if this was true. But, the, but, but when you think about it, this atheist who denies the existence of God has no reason to live. His life. Serves, I mean, in his view, life itself serves no lasting purpose. There's nothing to, to build up or to build upon because in his belief and in his belief system, all life will pass away and nothing will be remembered. And I know that <clears throat> their great hope would be to explore space and, and settle on other planets and continue with man. But the fact is that won't happen. Yeah, we got a space force and I think that's awesome. Yes, we've been to the moon, 
But folks, there's no other life out there other than what God created. And he tells us in the Bible that he created man for the earth and the earth for man. This is where we're going to live. Uh, but I know that their great hope is not in God. Their great hope is that they will somehow explore strange new worlds and seek other life forms and uh, go on that way. But in their heart, they know that's not true. They know that, that, that their best hope is, is no hope at all. Let me tell you about what Jesus said about a person with this atheistic belief. In Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 20, you, say, you may say, well, back when Jesus day, there were no atheists. Well, maybe, maybe not. Uh, certainly most believe that there was a deity or deities of some description, but there were people who lived like atheists. Let me tell you about one. Luke chapter 12, verse 16 through 21, and he spake a parable unto them saying, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast laid up much goods <clears throat> thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. This man had an atheistic viewpoint. In fact, this man has the exact correct viewpoint for those with an atheist worldview. Eat, drink, and be merry. Live for today. For tomorrow you die. You will not even be remembered. All Enjoy all you can, or as the old commercial used to say, grab all the gusto you can. For tomorrow you die. It's all over. Nothing matters. And yet Jesus said, thou fool. Jesus called him a fool. Well, what is a fool? What is a fool? Well, Jesus actually defined a fool for us. Uh, the Lord, the Lord defined a fool in Psalms 14, one and 53, one, it says the fool had said in his heart, there is no God. Or some would say the fool has said in his heart, no God or no God. I'll go with the King James. It says the fool denies the existence of God because he has to appease his conscience. The fool uh, denies the evidence for a creator, even though it is expansive and growing every day. Nature screams that there is a creator. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Psalms 19.1. The atheist is all about self, but he must be. For there's nothing else that matters in his world but himself. What a miserable existence. The atheist may claim that he cares about others, but he only does it to satiate his desire to feel good about himself. Because in, because in his world, only he matters. It is a world where he is God, with a little g, because he doesn't have power or control like God Almighty does. So he is the God of his own life, because God Almighty allows it. God says you have sovereignty over the decisions in your life. It's not something we took from God. It's something that God gave us. So the atheist is his own God. It's a world where, where he does not believe in transgressions except transgressions that offend his own self. Or you can only offend me or what I want or what I like. There's nothing else that matters. That is the atheist world. Some of us don't think what the atheist world is truly like. There's been a relatively good example uh, in the last century of what an atheist world would be like. I'll get to that in a second. But I'm saying what an awful worldview. Well, there's no place for love in this worldview. There's no place for kindness, for thinking of others, for self-sacrifice on behalf of others when you lose and they win. I mean, when you don't even get a good feeling out of it. This, that doesn't exist in the world of the atheist. You know, most agree, even the atheist agrees that man has a compelling need to be remembered. 
this is part of us wanting to have value. Some people call it self-worth. We need to feel needed, wanted, desired, like we've had a, a, an impact in this world. You know, all it takes to verify this fact is observation, both within how you feel and without how others feel. This is a compelling desire. It's something that, that God has put in us. And the atheist would say that this is a weakness that drives us to create and believe in a God or a uh, higher power or a greater mystical intelligence. That's what the atheist says about this compelling desire. He cannot deny that it exists, so he tries to use it to explain away that which he does deny, which is the existence of God. Yet the belief in God and the fact of the law has been written in our hearts by God and is the only source, the one and only source of both morality and self-worth. Now, why do I talk about morality? Because morality and self-worth go hand in hand. The atheist cannot claim any basis for morality. He may have morality. He may, he may try to say it came from someplace, but the only source of morality is the law of God. And, and the fact that there is a God to answer to. So the atheist has a problem. He has to borrow capital from the Christian. Let me give you an example of what uh, the, the real atheist view says. If it, if it were true, the atheist view, the evolutionary view, said there is no difference between the killing of the elderly, the infirm, the weak, the unwanted, the inconvenient, that would be the preborn, or any other human being, or even an ethnic group of millions of people, the atheist would say there's no difference than, from, than killing all of these people than there is in exterminating your home for roaches. To the evolutionist, who is compelled to be an agnostic if he's honest, all killing is the same. Because all life came from one accidental collision of atoms under perfect circumstances that don't exist. But the fact to the atheist is that a cockroach is as valuable as a human being, that a lion is as valuable as, as an ant, because it's all just a bunch of atoms. And it all exists for a short time and then doesn't exist. And eventually everything goes away. That is a depressing and a horrible worldview. It is a worldview without any morality whatsoever. And a world run by atheists is the kind of world that was actually going on in Germany during World War II under a regime by an evil man named Hitler who uh, murdered millions and had experiments with eugenics trying to have man create a better man. That is what atheism gives you. Don't like what I say? It's just truth. And sometimes truth hurts. But the scripture says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. The Hitler regime is a perfect example of an atheist regime. It's a better example than the Chinese regime uh, that is communist because uh, they are not quite as evil, I think. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I just don't know if as the Hitler regime. Imagine living in an atheist world. Imagine living in a world where atheism were true. It would be a terror. It would be a horrible place. Only God and Christianity make this a better place. Man doesn't. Man's beliefs don't. Um, the words of the preacher. The words of the preacher. Solomon. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. You know what the first part of that chapter says? Let's look and see what the rest of it says. What profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. He hath made everything beautiful in his time, and he hath set the world in their heart, so that no man can find out the work of God maketh from the beginning to the end. He hath set the world in their heart. What does that mean? means that God has put eternity in our hearts. 
It means that that God has has made us know we cannot deny that there's more that 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 God exists that the that and, and this desire to be mem- remembered has to do with us knowing that there is an eternity that things do go on and that the things we do actually matter. The things you do they matter for eternity. In the lives that you interact with, the things that that we we uh, accomplish matter for eternity, and that is a good thing. It might be a bad thing if the things we've done are evil. God's keeping score; He's keeping count. When God breathed into Adam's nostrils a breath of life, He gave him an eternal spirit, a spirit that will live forever, and a spirit that cries out that the soul of man and impresses on our psyche that there is an eternity and we will all face an eternity somewhere and we need to deal with that. Men who love sin, who love the things of the world, they compensate for this this drive that God's put in us. They, They placate it. They attempt to satiate this drive by comforting himself that he will be remembered long after he passes. And he names his possessions, his inventions, his theorems, his ideas after himself. He seeks public acclaim. He desires a legacy. He creates children. He creates vast sums of wealth, sets up foundations and charitable trusts, makes colleges and universities his benefactor, all trying to pacify this compunction that God has placed in there to drive him to God. The psalmist, David, speaks in Psalms 49, verse 6. He says, They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious and it ceaseth forever that he should still live forever and not see corruption. For he seeth that wise men die, likewise the fool and the brutish person perish, and leave their wealth to others. Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever, and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. Nevertheless, man, being an honor, abideth not. He is like the beasts that perish, This their way is their folly. The atheist belief is a folly. It is their own folly to deny all the things that God has put in us to cause us to seek him, to drive us to him. Eternity in our hearts, the law of God written in our hearts. The atheist denies these things, finds excuses, does other things to compensate and runs from God, drives him out of his life, rejects him. For what? Emptiness. Emptiness of soul. Emptiness of of a future. And as we know, an eternity without God or others in a horrible place. A place we call hell. God refers to it later as the lake of fire. So what's my point in all this? Am I trying to depress you? No, because we have a different worldview. And we're the only worldview that makes sense. The only worldview that goes with what God has put in us naturally. You know, we 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 now, when we teach people to shoot, um, we teach them to go with what comes naturally. We teach them to get into a natural stance. We teach them to hold a gun in a way that's more natural so that they're not fighting the things that go uh, naturally for them. So it's easier for them to learn to shoot and they can pick up the good habits faster. Now, I didn't learn things that way. And so I've had to relearn them. But the fact is, and I said that because it's easier to go, it's smarter to go with what's natural in what God has put inside us, in our hearts. Our world, I want to encourage you, Christian, our worldview is the right and the only worldview. It's the only true one. And your heart tells you that scripture says, and you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free by knowing the truth. It bears witness with what's in your heart and it makes you free. We were created by God for his glory. We were created by God to, to have joy and peace and fulfillment and living for him. Psalms 37, four, delight thyself also in the Lord. And he will give thee the desires of thine heart. 
Psalms 119 too. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. So, uh, Acts 17, 27, Paul is being says that they should seek the Lord if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. In Isaiah 55, verses 6 and 7, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord for he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Friends, God does have great plans for each of us. It may not be the plans we have and it may involve pain and suffering but it's for his glory, for glorifying his son and he has done everything for us. He has given us Everything by paying for our sins with his sacrifice. The only thing that could. And we can live for him and within the, the, the uh, ways that he set for us and have joy and peace and kindness. And we can have a world like that if we will spread the gospel to others and encourage the biblical worldview in others. America has been a great nation for centuries because America feared God and America was good. And even though not everybody was saved, there was a strong Christian ethic that influenced the laws and the behavior in this country. America's changing because God's been thrown out. Don't throw God out of your life. Embrace him. He's waiting for you. He's not far away. We just saw that. He'll forgive you and he will abundantly pardon. Make God the center, the most important thing of your life today and every day. Commit all you have, your strength, your mind, your time, your, your resources, your wealth, your possessions. Give them all to God. God gives back more than we could ever ask or hope for. Not in things that will take us away from him, but in the things that really count and last forever. Your actions, your behavior, it is going to be remembered. It is going to have an impact on eternity. Make it a good one. God bless you all. Let's close in prayer. And remember, today is a day to go into the house of God and to worship him. David said, I was glad when they said, let's go into the house of God. Let's hope to see you there today. Father in heaven, thank you for what you've put in our hearts. You don't let us go astray. You allow it, but you don't You don't allow it with many things to draw us back to you. You draw the atheist. You draw those who have turned from atheism to seek you. You draw them. And those of us who have found you and trust you, you continually draw us. Help us to answer you. Help us to, to be drawn back to you. Help us to, to give it all to you, to live for you and make the lives that we have, the things that we do, count for eternity so that on that day when we meet you, you might be pleased and you might say, well done, good and faithful servant. We do love you. We thank you for Jesus Christ and for loving us. Bless us this day and bless this day in your houses all over this nation and the world that your name would be glorified and people would come to Christ and Christians would, 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 for, would confess and turn back to you. And God in heaven, please save our nation. In Christ's name, amen. See you next week, folks.